Hey, this is Dr. Emily Scherning with AR. Today, we're going to take a more detailed, more visual look at how Alaska is projected to change throughout this century. If you've checked out our previous Alaska video, you know we're talking about an extremely high level of change with big challenges and big opportunities. In this more visual update, let's get some more detail on where we're expecting to see big transformations. So if you're not familiar with climate in Alaska, this is a state that has already been experiencing the highest level of change in the U.S. With our video this past October regarding the recent crab collapse, we've talked a little bit right on this channel about how Alaska is a place where change is not theoretical. We see major change happening now. So it's not shocking communities in Alaska are further along in their climate response than in many other states. In this figure from the National Climate Assessment, we can see that this region down here, which I know is of interest to many of our viewers, had adaptation plans in progress five years ago. This figure is from five years ago. You can see it was very widespread all across the state. Communities were doing impact assessments, progressing in adaptation plans, and in some places had already completed initial plans. This is in response to changes that are expected to only increase as we move through this century. Here's our key maps for this video. These are projected changes in average annual temperature under 4.5 and 8 scenarios. Please note they're both end of century, not mid-century maps. We could be looking at uh, 8 to 10 degrees of annual change by end of century under 4.5. That's huge. It could be even huger under 8.5, talking about 14 to 16, 16 up at the very top of the world here. There is good news. We're in uh, both of these scenarios, and I do think we should focus in on 4.5 as our most likely future. We see relatively low levels of change here in southern and southeastern Alaska. Under RCP 4.5 and 8.5, we see pretty good levels of stability around Juneau. In uh, Anchorage under 4.5, really not looking too bad. Uh, Fairbanks is going to be in an area with a higher level of change, but some interesting outlook. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So they don't have to make their own choices, but areas with a lower level of relative change are the most desirable areas to my way of thinking. Even if the outcome for a high change area is potentially very good, which you may see up in the far north there, a high change process is difficult to navigate. A lower level of change is easier on the ecosystem, less tree death, less wildfire, easier on the infrastructure, safer. I'm sure some of you watching will be attracted to the higher change areas we'll discuss soon. There are interesting new opportunities emerging in Alaska, but I do feel like it's worth giving my boring security focused stance on this issue. While we're looking at this lower change part of Alaska, I do want to take a quick look at sea level rise projections for southern Alaska because I think you'll like what you see. So check this out. These are um, nationwide sea level rise projections. We don't have a cool tool nationally to look in on Alaska as well as we do for other places in the continental U.S. But you can see blue and light blue here and here in both 4.5 and 8.5 scenarios. That actually means a projected decrease in sea level rise for some of our lowest change areas that we looked at on temperature, Juneau and Anchorage probably falling into areas where we're not seeing threats from sea level rise, might need to do some um, adaptation related to harbor retreat, but that is not as big a deal as dealing with uh, direct inundation with serious storm surge that's going to impact infrastructure. Very helpful for our lower rate of change areas. And as you can see, the projections vary tremendously around the state. I think that as we start moving into the rest of the video, using that sea level rise figure is a good way to frame it. We're looking at intense changes to both the land and the sea in Alaska. You can tell that the risks are going to vary intensely around the state depending on your exact location. I'm going to start by talking about other changes to the land, then we'll talk about changes to the sea. So when we're talking about the coasts, it brings up the importance of erosion. And this is up in the far north, up at the top of the world here. The erosion rates along Alaska's north coast are insane and are projected to stay insane. Look at what the red is. Minus 61 feet a year is where it maxes out. A lot of these red areas are seeing 50 foot changes in where the coastline is a year. And the riverine issues, the river erosion is also a big deal. That very first figure we looked at where many of the communities are preparing adaptation plans, a lot of them are to respond to the increases in river and coastal erosion. If you're interested in getting serious about looking at what's happening with erosion in Alaska, both rivers and coasts, 
I would refer you to this more local resource. Alaska's Department of Natural Resources has this incredible geological and geophysical survey page, where if we look at maps and data, there are a ton of interactive maps that can help you answer very location specific questions in the state that would impact erosion. And I just want to point out, they have inundation maps, my personal favorite thing to be very nervous about. Very nice to know that you have a good interactive source of information on this if you're considering anything in coastal Alaska. It's worth noting that in Alaska, issues around land stability are not limited to coastal and riverine erosion. In Alaska, we're also dealing with loss of permafrost. In the National Climate Assessment, there's a consensus projection that near surface permafrost will likely disappear on 16 to 24% of the Alaskan landscape by the end of the 21st century. I found this cool map for you to try and figure out where the risks are higher or lower. And uh, let's check that out. I'll put a link to this paper in the video description. All right, so let's get oriented on this map. We got the North Pole right here. We got Russia here. We got the US and Canada here. We have levels of risk for loss of near surface permafrost, low, moderate, and high on the map here. And we got a couple colors of lines. The yellow indicates pipelines, the blue electrical systems. We can see that a lot of this hopeful territory in Alaska here where it was relatively low risk, we are in terms of temperature change and in terms of sea level rise, we also see fairly low risk for uh, subsidence, for loss of permafrost. And that's true throughout Canada too. It's nice to see that our friends are also having a, because one might expect. But look over on the other side of the ocean here, the Russia has a number of places where their critical infrastructure is likely to be in moderate to high risk areas for permafrost subsidence. So nice to keep an eye on the global picture there, you know? Permafrost thought is a major issue. In impacted areas, it's a big change, and like every big change, it's presenting challenges and opportunities. There's a small-scale challenge if your home or your community happens to have buildings or infrastructure on thawing permafrost. It's going to mess you up. It's going to crack your foundations, your roads, your plumbing, everything. You scale the challenge up a little bit, there are serious concerns about diseases emerging from the melting permafrost. Old diseases that we don't have immunity to anymore. If you scale up the challenge again, there's a serious issue around the methane that can be released when permafrost thaws. Methane is a greenhouse gas. The methane that will be released when the permafrost thaws is going to be part of the emissions problem. We'll need to deal with it on a global level. So big challenges. But as always, that does mean opportunities. As the permafrost thaws, that is opening up new land to agriculture in Alaska. If you've looked at the national overview, we know we're looking at probable decreased yields in much of the U.S., particularly in the southwest and the southeast. So the potential of future Alaskan agriculture, there's a lot of hope and a lot of interest there. If you're seriously interested, I, I have a very serious paper for you that I think that you will enjoy. It's the Agroclimate Projections for a Warming Alaska. This was cited in the National Climate Assessment. It's a cool paper. It is mostly based on RCP 8.5 modeling, but it has a fantastic level of modeling, including maps for precipitation and potential changes in growing degree days. You're going to like it if you're a serious person. There are system challenges inherent to an Alaskan agriculture commercial level scale up, but if you're a person interested in homesteading and increased self-sufficiency, those challenges might not apply to you. The intense variability, the local variability of the landscape that's opening up it's going to present opportunities that are best utilized by caring, knowledgeable, interested people on the ground. The land transformation here inland in Alaska is just mind blowing. Up about Fairbanks, it's it's really intense. If I'm talking about new land opening up for agriculture, that should be making you think about how crazy it has to be for the native life forms, right? Let's talk about what's going on there. I want to talk about this a little bit from an ecosystem perspective. One of the major ecosystems in Alaska has been spruce forest. That ecosystem is shifting away from coniferous forest, from pine trees, towards deciduous forest, particularly like a shrub-heavy ecosystem. The big herbivore is changing from caribou to moose. We're getting more rabbits coming in, more beaver coming in in some areas with their associated terraforming activities. Emphasizing our understanding of change, not just as loss, but there is new life rushing in as well as old life forms struggling is very important to understand this picture of transforming Alaska. And this transformation is gonna have some violence. We expect a lot of the spruce forest to die and to burn. Wildfire will be an increasing and serious problem for some time in this state. 
From a human perspective, there will be areas to live in Alaska's climate future that are less cold, where it's easier to grow food. It might be more desirable for people to move to the Alaska of the future than Alaska as it is now. Although the extreme seasonal day-night differences will remain a challenging adjustment for some folks. So take a, a basic cost of living measure. So this is uh, from 2000 to 2015, we're looking at energy needed for heating has decreased across much of Alaska from 2000 to 2015 by like five to 8%. Every percent that it decreases is about $10 million reduction in consumer spending. So if you're a person who's interested in sustainability, you might not be interested in going to a place where you need to use a lot of energy to survive. That energy budget is decreasing in Alaska. It's worth noting. Potential upsides, though, for people interested in this more temperate landscape, a less Arctic landscape, it comes at a major cost to traditional lifeways. Traditional food sources, traditional indigenous lifeways, it's hard to say if they're going to be possible in the future. The changes to the land and ocean ecosystems are, are enormous. There's a lot of pain here. There's a great deal of grief, and it's a challenging emotional landscape to navigate. Although there are many opportunities coming with this change for many living things, for moose as well as people, we do need also to acknowledge the loss here and the danger. And speaking of danger, let's move towards the sea. We're looking at an overall picture of even greater transformation there than we saw on the land. First thing that we need to acknowledge when we talk about changes to Alaska is that we're losing the sea ice. It's happening. This is a figure, I'll, I'll link to the report in the video description. You can see these ranges, these shaded ranges of uncertainty around the 8.5 and 4.5 models. You can see that they didn't even put the uncertainty range around the 2.6 model because it's so unlikely that we'll hit it. And you can see where observations have been falling on the range of this model. It's been like as bad as the models could possibly predict, right? And that the 4.5 scenario has a big range of where we might expect sea ice melt to be going, right? In times that it can even dip lower than the 8.5 model, that 4.5 model. So if we look at this, if we look at these overlapping uncertainty ranges, if we look at the current trends, it's hard to see that we're not gonna be dealing with the Arctic with almost no sea ice by 2040. And that's gonna be a huge change. I wanna talk about the ecosystem level change as we shift away from the ice. So Alaska's waters, they used to be a, what's called a benthic dominated ecosystem where you would have a primary producer, the ice algae, and that a food particles would kind of drift down to the benthic zone towards the bottom of the water column near the ocean floor. As the ice algae go away with the ice and as so many other organisms whose life cycles are ice dependent are gonna go away with the ice, we're gonna move into a pelagic dominated future where phytoplankton become your main producer of the ecosystem, feeding a whole different food chain, including different mammals like bowhead whales may move into the area as walrus range is severely decreased. And pelagic fish, middle water column fish, upper water column fish from throughout the seas are gonna come rushing into this new area. Fish who need colder water are going to be pushed up from like the whole rest of the world. So there's going to be tremendous loss as we lose the ice, as we move from this benthic dominated past towards a pelagic dominated future and open ocean Arctic. If that was the only change the ocean and marine ecosystems were gonna be experiencing, this would already be wild, turbulent, chaotic, powerful change, but there's more. We need to take a look at ocean acidification trends. If you're not familiar with the phenomena of ocean acidification, as CO2 has increased in the atmosphere, water absorbs CO2. We experience this like every time we drink a carbonated beverage. We know that CO2 can be absorbed into water. When that happens, the pH of the solution goes down. It becomes more acidic. And this has big impacts on shell building organisms from oysters to crabs to lobsters. Anything that builds a calcium carbonate shell is going to have its shell building impacted by a more acidic environment. It's just basic chemistry. When we look at projected changes in Arctic ocean acidity, we see some of the most dramatic, most intense and rapid acidification on the planet. The Bufo Sea is already below the line. We're already seeing impacts on living things in that area. 
we can see that we're really near the line already in the Chuchi Sea, and that maybe the Bering Sea we could pull out if we had some sort of uh, mechanism for intervention. But this is serious. This is something that is already happening and it's projected to have a major impact on uh, fisheries in the area. But because ocean acidification means big ecosystem changes. Many organisms, the acidification makes it so that their eggs and their juvenile life stages have a harder time surviving. It doesn't just impact adults' abilities to form shelves. I read some studies on different crab species. You can imagine there's a lot of funding for uh, you know, economically important work like that. It's basically certain that within 10 years, we're gonna see a severe decline in many traditional Alaskan fisheries. They're looking at like a 50% drop in tanner crabs as a baseline assumption. But I wanna look before you get too depressed at the overall projected impact on fisheries. Because in Alaska, you have to remember there's gonna be both this terrible dying and new life rushing in. So looking at the potential impact on US fisheries, with all of that life rushing into Alaska, I want us to go down and see this color blue here. This is a 10 to 20% increase is projected in total fish catch in this extremely high change area, this area where there's tremendous coastal erosion, where there's projected enormous temperature change. The native species, the native ecosystems are going to be terribly impacted by this, but the total catch is likely to actually increase, which is pretty wild. This color here is a zero to 10% drop. This color here is a 10 to 20% gain. So you're not really looking necessarily at total overall drops for Alaska fisheries. It's going to be very significant, especially because we do expect to see some level of drop in the rest of North American fisheries writ broad. Step away from thinking about this as a commercial problem, as a fisheries problem. While there are plenty of shelving organisms that people eat directly, we need also to think about how many other living things eat these organisms, the impact on the whole ecosystem, the way the living ocean breathes with our planet. This is way bigger than a fisheries problem. The ocean stuff, folks, from an ecology perspective, a biology perspective, this ocean stuff is just really hard and really sad. If you know a marine biologist, you know they're not okay. None of our friends in marine biology are okay. Throughout the world, there are higher levels of change happening in the sea than the land that's projected to continue. In Alaska, we gotta look right at that change. If you're curious about what ocean animals are likely to win out in this crazy level of ocean change, I hear to put your bets on squid. As a group, they're likely to be physiologically resilient to the changes and they are intelligent problem solving organisms. But let's pull this all together on Alaska. This is some wild stuff happening. It's not a smooth ride. The challenges and the opportunities are both very much Alaska sized. Like we saw at the beginning of this outlook, Southern Alaska, it looks like a pretty good option, a low change option. And as you go further north, the scale of change gets dramatic. I wanna pull up that temperature figure again, just to frame us as we close out. So if we check this out and sum this up, and remember, let's focus in on RCP 4.5. That's our most likely future. We've checked the slopes on CO2 and temperature from recent data since these reports were published. We're on track. We can see that down here in Southern Alaska, we have some pretty appealing, relatively low change area. Not gonna get too much hotter. Sea level rise looks locally good in quite a few areas. And the frost loss doesn't look like it's gonna be a super serious threat to the area. And then as you move up north, you get areas where there's going to be more agricultural land opening up with a lot of intensely interesting local opportunities. And then you get up here into crazy town up on the top of the world where we're gonna see huge changes in coastline, 50 coastline change every year, huge changes in temperature, huge changes in sea level rise, new forms of life rushing, forms of life struggling and dying. It's gonna be a madhouse. It's gonna be a complete change from the Arctic we have known. If we look at Alaska, there's going to be loss, there's going to be grief, there will be fortunes made, there's going to be just tremendous change. And some folks is going to be very attractive to them. You might imagine anytime there's big change, there are winners and there are losers and there are going to be winners in Alaska in the next 30 years. If you're like me, a little more conservative, I'd say these low change areas in the south, particularly where you see good sea level rise projections, they look pretty good territory, pretty safe, your overall energy needs are likely to decrease. You're gonna have some more applicability of traditional life ways and knowledge that will persist. 
But you head up north there, you're going to need to place your bets. The one thing we know for sure is the future there won't be like the past. None of the changes we're talking about, though, mean an absence of life. They mean intense competition between new forms of life and old. There will be grief and there will be hope. Alaska has always been a unique place, attractive to hearty people. You can see there's a good margin of hope here. If this is the place for you, you better buckle up. But I bet you know that Alaska's already been getting ready.